Hi and welcome to 10 Minute Teaching. I'm Ben Campbell. Today I'm going to be giving you my 10 minute introduction on Shakespeare. The Bard of Avon might sound like the name of a Dungeons and Dragons character, but it's actually just one of the titles given to acclaimed 16th century writer William Shakespeare. That said, Shakespeare does share many of the qualities that we might associate with classic fantasy heroes, uh, a mysterious backstory, uh, superhuman abilities, and a legendary legacy that persists to this very day. In this video, I'm going to be giving you all the vital information that you need to know about this most acclaimed of wordsmiths. Let's talk first then about Shakespeare's personal life. Now, it might surprise you, but the number of things we actually know about Shakespeare can really be counted on one hand. We know when and where he was born, we know where he went to school, we know about his family situation, who his parents were, who he got married to, who his children were, things like that. We know pretty much when and where he did his work and lived, and we know when he died. But that's about it. Just think about that for a moment. One of the most famous writers of all time, and we barely know anything about him. In fact, there are entire years where we have no information about what he was up to at all. Pretty mysterious. There are some things that we do know about Shakespeare which are pretty interesting. Uh, we know he went to school, but he didn't go to university, as most of the playwrights at the time would have. He got married when he was just 18 to a woman who was eight years older than him and who was already three months pregnant take from that what you will about Shakespeare's personal life. And we know that he actually became pretty popular and fairly rich even in his own lifetime, making a living of being a poet and a playwright. So much so that he was able to buy the second largest house in Stratford-upon-Avon, his hometown, by the time he had died. So this strange and mysterious backstory might be one of the reasons that we are so interested in Shakespeare even to this day. Of course, one of the other main reasons is the incredible works of literature which he was able to produce in his lifetime. Let's take a look at those next. I don't think it's an overstatement to say that Shakespeare's writing ability was quite literally superhuman. It's not just about the number of works he was able to create in his lifetime, which is a lot, by the way, 38 plays, three long narrative poems, and 154 sonnets. It's also about the incredible quality of those works and the incredible range of genres that Shakespeare was able to master. Let's take a quick overview of his writing career and how it developed. We think that Shakespeare began writing in around about 1589, 1590, something like that, and it was clear from the get-go that Shakespeare was going to try his hand at three different types of plays that were common at the time. Histories, which focused on famous historical figures. For Shakespeare, this was usually uh, kings of England. Uh, tragedies, which focused on the fall of a great hero, uh, usually because of some kind of fatal flaw in that hero's character. And finally, comedies, where mistaken identities and confused characters would get all mixed up before ultimately everything becoming fixed, and this usually ends in a marriage. Shakespeare was pretty consistent with putting out plays of all three of these different genres over the course of his career, although there is a general shift from a lot of focus on histories and comedies in the early 1590s, gradually getting more and more uh, towards tragedies in the late 1590s and in the 1600s. Now, some scholars have attributed the cause of this slightly darker shift in tone to the death of Shakespeare's only son, Hamnet, in 1596 although with so little information about Shakespeare's personal life, it's really hard to actually pin this down for sure. Interestingly, although the plays are what we focus on now, really, they weren't actually what made Shakespeare a famous writer in his own time. Really what secured his fame in the 16th century were his long narrative poems. During the years of 1593 to 1594, all the theatres in London were closed due to an outbreak of the bubonic plague. And it was during this time that Shakespeare wrote two long poems dedicated to the Earl of Southampton. Venus and Adonis was the first one, and it was followed by a sequel, The Rape of Lucrece. Both of these poems were instant hits, practically blockbusters in the 16th century. They were reprinted many times after their initial publication, which was not particularly usual, and they really helped to secure Shakespeare's uh, status as a prominent writer. Uh, and they really helped to fund all of the things that he was doing then in the theatre later. 
He's also well known, of course, for writing sonnets, and he actually gives his name to a particular kind of sonnet, the Shakespearean sonnet. Uh, 154 of these sonnets were collected and published in 1609, although it seems that at the time they weren't quite as popular as some of his earlier, longer poems. Today, of course, they're just as famous as all the rest of Shakespeare's works. And it's the incredible range, as well as the quality, of these various different types of writing, done before novels were really a thing, that has helped to make Shakespeare such a prominent writer in the history of English literature, a legacy which continues to this day. Let's take a look at the effect of that legacy next. To be or not to be, we are such stuff as dreams are made on. These violent delights have violent ends. What? You egg? Shakespeare's given us plenty of interesting phrases over the years, but his legacy doesn't stop there. Individual words have come from Shakespeare into the English language as well. Some scholars think as many as 3,000, and including some common words that you might use every day. Words like lonely, uncomfortable, and lacklustre all have their first recorded use in Shakespeare's works. But it doesn't stop there. Whole plot lines have been reimagined and reinterpreted as the years have gone by. Uh, sometimes you might not even know that you're watching Shakespeare. For example, if you've ever seen The Lion King, you've seen Hamlet, uh, but with lions and a much nicer ending. If you were to watch uh, Ten Things I Hate About You, you're actually watching The Taming of the Shrew, set in a high school. And if you'd ever like a musical version of Romeo and Juliet, you can watch West Side Story. Essentially, it seems that every successive generation looks at Shakespeare's works and finds something in them that is related to their own lives. If you've ever felt jealousy, you can see that in Othello. If you've ever had a difficult relationship with your parents, you can see that in Romeo and Juliet. If your friends have ever left you in a mystical forest and uh, fairies have turned your head into that of a donkey's, that's less likely, I admit, but Midsummer Night's Dream has you covered. Basically, even if you're a student rolling your eyes at having to do another Shakespeare play, try and see through the old-fashioned language and the admittedly bad jokes, and see what Shakespeare's really trying to show us. Just people. People like you and me, struggling with, generally, everyday problems. It's that focus on human nature that makes Shakespeare's plays so wonderful to watch, even hundreds of years in the future. And I'm sure that's the thing that we'll keep coming back to Shakespeare's works for, for a hundred years more. So let's have a quick recap. In this video, we discussed Shakespeare's personal life, his literary career, and the legacy that that career has left behind. Although we're unlikely to find out more about the biography of Shakespeare's life, and perhaps that adds to his celebrity status, it does seem like his works are going to continue to be reimagined and reinterpreted by successive generations. Across the variety of poems and plays that he produced in his 52 years, there's such a wealth of colourful life that it seems obvious why he would be picked as one of the greatest writers of all time. Well, that's it for this episode of 10 Minute Teaching. Some further reading will be in the description. If you like this video and found it useful, don't forget to like and subscribe, check out some of the other videos on the channel, and if you have some ideas for more things that you would like me to teach you in 10 minutes, leave them down in the comments section below. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time.